This is Healthcare's Missing Logic podcast, episode number 140. Today, our special guest is Dr. Michael Bly. We have a stimulating conversation about his lessons in leadership and post pandemic opportunities for leaders. So stay tuned. Welcome back to Healthcare's Missing Logic podcast. This is the only podcast that shows you how to leverage polarity intelligence, an essential competency for healthcare leaders and the missing logic in healthcare, so you can create healthy healing organizations and become a thriving, resilient, and unstoppable healthcare leader. We are your hosts, Teresa Christofferson and Michelle Troset. We've been best friends and colleagues for over 30 years. And during that time, we coached healthcare leaders across North America around how to create healthy healing organizations. Today, we coach healthcare leaders and leadership teams to live thriving, resilient, and balanced lives, combat burnout, and create the best places to give and receive care. This podcast is for the unsung hero of healthcare, the healthcare leader. We want you to know we see you and we'll be here for you each week. In this podcast, we're going to challenge healthcare's industry norms, flip limiting beliefs, and share proven strategies so you can be your best self at working at home live and lead intentionally and experience well-being and joy. We are glad you are here and look forward to sharing the journey with you. If you aren't totally convinced this podcast is for you, just listen to a few episodes and convince yourself. Well, hello. Welcome to Healthcare's Missing Logic Podcast. This is Tracy. And this is Michelle. And we're just having another day in the studio, living the dream. Living the dream. Living and, the dream in green. In green. <laughs> it's St. Patty's week, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Woo-hoo. The only thing we don't have here is some green beer. Nope, we don't. We might have to remedy that. <laughs> But we do have an incredible interview for you. Now, we say that all the time, but this is really good. Yes, it was excellent. And it just warms my heart that we had Dr. Michael Bly on our podcast. Yeah, it was my first time to meet Michael. And wow, what a first meeting. So impressed and so inspired by him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He, uh, I, I guess you could say, and you guys will find out soon when you listen, we were all in harmony together. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, we were. We were harmonizing. <laughs> we were. And he's one of our new buddies. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 But just, you know, great perspective. Mm-hmm. He is, he just has such an incredible background and such a futuristic thinking person, right? And I can see why he's leading a center for innovation and quality and safety. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I just thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, I did too. I did too. It makes you appreciate the unique opportunities that come into his life. You know, he must be a really special person when you, and you'll hear the stories. It's like all these unique things have happened. He's done some phenomenal leadership. And now he is so passionate about sharing his wisdom with others. Yeah, yeah. And his new model for leadership is really um, profound. It's really, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it aligns really well with what we're doing. So Yes. You know, of course, we didn't have anything to talk about. <laughs> <clears throat> that's right. That's right. Well, let me introduce you to our guests, and then we will get on to the interview. Dr. Michael Bly is a Wisconsin native who has held clinical consultative service academic and association leadership positions. A recognized scholar and thought leader, Dr. Bly has addressed national and international audiences, including nurses, executives, governance bodies, associations, and the media. Four contributions are significant of his. His engagement as one of the five nurses on the committee that wrote the seminal report, The Future of Nursing, Leading Change, Advancing Healthcare, which was issued through the Institute of Medicine. Wisdom at Work, The Importance of the Older and Experienced Nurse in the Workplace, published through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Men in Nursing, Understanding the Challenges Men Face in the Predominantly Female Profession. And Analysis of the Nursing Workforce Crisis, A Call to Action, both published in the American Journal of Nursing. 
He completed fellowships with the Robert Wood Johnson Executive Nurse Fellows Program, the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. An inductee at the American Academy of Nursing and the National Academies of Practice, he also served as the president of both CGFNS International and FNINR, both advance the science and ensure workforce mobility, quality, and safety. He is currently the president and CEO of Nurse Dynamics LLC and directs the Langston Center for Innovation in Quality and Safety at Virginia Commonwealth University School of Nursing. Wow. Ooh. Yes. And without further ado, here is our interview with Michael Bly. Well, welcome, Michael Bly, to Healthcare's Missing Logic podcast. <laughs> Well, hello to both of you. Thank you for inviting me to the podcast. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Yeah, I am too. It's such a pleasure to meet you. I know you're a colleague, longtime colleague and friend of Michelle's, but this is our first meeting. I'm super excited. Well, and as I oh, and told you're be... you, listening to the two of you together, I feel like I have some insight into your special relationship. So it's great to meet you as well. Glad to be part of yeah. your um, your commune of friends here that um, <laughs> that are trying to make change happen in the world today. Uh, so. uh, we're, we're glad to have you. And by the time we're done, we'll all be buds. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt about it. So, Michael, we noted in our introduction of you to our audience that you have quite a diversified portfolio of leadership experiences in healthcare, including academia and in industry. And as you reflect on your journey as a leader, uh, we thought it'd be great to share with our listeners what maybe what your brightest spot has been as a leader in healthcare. Oh, well, given that I started working in healthcare on my 18th birthday, um, and I'm well into going to be hitting a, a landmark birthday this March, um, it's been a long journey. And, and it's an interesting question because I never, I was going to be a music teacher and, and kind of ended up getting into healthcare because I took piano lessons right after a hospital administrator's daughter took piano lessons and the hospital administrator convinced me to go work for him. And so that's how I meandered into a healthcare career. I, I, I think one of the areas that probably influenced my thinking about healthcare more than anything was when I was very young in my career and I was working in Wisconsin at St. Mary's Medical Center and we built a new hospital. And I was invited because I was young and didn't have a lot of conformity. I hadn't been socialized into the rigor of how the units are structured. There was a man in, um, in Canada, an architect by the name of Gordon Friesen. And there were about 30 hospitals built in the United States on the Friesen concept. And the Friesen concept was a hospital with all private rooms. We used, it was where the nurse server was introduced, putting supplies at the bedside. Um, we used technology, which back in the day was nothing more than a call light system and a pager. But nurses never carried pagers before. And it was a no nursing station concept. We charted at the bedside. And, and so I was invited into that world of, of getting to design that. Um, I remember visiting St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Lincoln, Nebraska, and St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville. And here I am, a relatively young nurse who is getting to take a look and engage with what they called SPD back in the day, supplies, processing, and distribution. Um, I worked with dietary. I worked with all these departments, and I got to see how every, every part of every discipline intersected with each other. And we designed it in because there was, other than this template, um, there was no other hospitals like it. So when I think about probably the highlight that shaped the way I think and the way I mm -hmm. approach systems development and think of the upstream and downstream impact of how nurses fit into that, that would, that would be probably one of those lifetime things that I didn't know it at the time, but as I think back, 
that was that was probably a highlight for me. Wow, that's such a great example of just being in the right place at the right time and being indoctrinated to systems thinking before a lot of your colleagues were even exposed to it. Well, and it was not meant even to knowing be. that yes. that's what it was. That, I mean, I had no language for it. So, but right. getting to be part of it, you know, it was about being in that role. So you, yeah. you, you mentioned that it, it was being yeah. in the right place yeah. at the right time. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. it was absolutely meant to be. I have no doubt about it. That that wasn't chance. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So, Michael, um, I know you know that a new Future of Nursing report was released this year, um, and uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But before we do, I want to kind of go back a little bit to the the first uh, Institute of Medicine Future of Nursing report, and you were on the committee for that report. And um, before we talk about the next one, I want to just step back a little bit again and have you reflect on what was your biggest leadership takeaway from that experience with that IOM Future of Nursing report um, that was released in 2010? Well, you know, yes, it was 10 years ago, you know, basically 10 years, a little over 10 years ago now. Yeah. Um, and one being one of the five nurses, there are a couple of takeaways actually about leadership. The first one is um, a lot of nurses back in the day said, why wasn't it all made up of nurses? Why wasn't the I? Because by, by legal design, um, it was intended to always intended to be a multi-professional consumer-based perspective of, it wasn't nurses talking to nurses. It was yeah. about how could we serve the public? And I was so taken with Donna Shalala, who, who led that report. I, I think she really changed my life and thinking in several ways. One is the persistence of her reminding us that we're doing this for the public to serve the public not the other way around. Um, and so to be present in public and hear what the public thought of us as a discipline and what they needed from us was very different than what we were doing to and for the public. So that was one thing. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, um, I don't know if you remember, but the Affordable Care Act was being passed in parallel to the release of this report. And one of the things I noticed with this report is that they held it up because of COVID. But our first report was held up because of the ACA. And working with Donna Shalala, the one thing that I, I have taken with me since then, don't go for a second tier layer of information. Go to the top. Don't be afraid to think big and ask big. And so when, and she had access to national and internationally renowned leaders. And she was a champion of nursing. And of course, why wouldn't you bring in the brightest and the best to inform us? So at any level along the way, um, don't be afraid to ask and think big and go outside of your boundaries. Um, it seems so, why, why is that so rudimentary sounding? But it's not what we do. We kind of take advantage of who's around us. And it's almost like we forget how big the world is and how much talent is out there. So if I take away anything personally from the exchanges with Donna Shalala, it would be to think big, um, expect a lot. Um, don't be afraid to take control of the culture and set the culture and the tone um, and to stay focused on message. Those would be the big leadership lessons I took from that. Wow. Uh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I have, I mean, Donna wouldn't know that I have a love affair with her, but I, I actually, <laughs> I learned more from her in, in those 18 months than I can ever put words to. And I feel eternally grateful for the opportunity to have exposure to that kind of careful, shrewd, capable thinking to benefit nursing. And here, you know, she's been recognized by nurses and, and by our discipline, but she is such a great leader on so many fronts and especially surrounding healthcare. 
Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why we asked you, because we believe when you have experiences like that, you know, there's so much more you get out of it than you put into it, right? <clears throat> that having exposure to somebody like that really is just has incredible impact on who you become and who you are going forward. It's not just coming together to write a report, right? <laughs> right. I mean, there's just so much that you got out of that. That's just so profound. That's well, thank really... you for that. And, and you know, when I got the call to invite me um, to be part of this, I had a choice to make to walk through the door or not. Mm -hmm. Of the 2.1 million nurses that were, you know, that was our number at the time. It's higher than that today. I thought, why me? You know, then I started thinking, well, why not me? And, and so I recognized that one of the things Donna did, uh, there were five nurses and all of us represented very distinctive generations. There were generational, cultural, ethnic um, um, variants. And that's exactly what she wanted. It wasn't a group of the same people with the same perspective. And, and one of her early statements was that we're not writing a report for the younger nurses to follow. We're writing a report with them so that we get their voice at the table at the time and how profound that was. Well, yeah, because they bring a perspective you would never have as exactly. a long term you know, leader and nurse, right, in the profession. And I just love that, you know, getting outside your box. And mm -hmm. we tend not to do that, as you said, right? We tend to just stick close to the people that think like us, right? And we don't like to be pushed, yeah. right, like yeah. outside of our own thinking. So I think that's just really profound. And uh, to not be afraid to ask, just ask for it and think that's outside right. of it. I'm if a big believer in that. <laughs> well, that's the only thing that makes change happen, right? right. Like that's Absolutely. that's what stimulates it. Exactly. And look so at, now we and look at ahead. what's happened with that report in 10 years. I, I know. mean, that report was never designed um, to sit on the shelf. And with the help of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Sue Hassmiller and others, you know, people have really it became a blue true blueprint for action. So that mm -hmm. it's been amazing to watch it unfold and to have been a part of it. Yeah. And now we have a new one. Yes, we do. <laughs> we have a new one. As, as Michelle said, now we've got a new Future of Nursing report, which was published in May of 2021. And um, now it's under the direction of the National Academy of Medicine. And we talk quite a bit about that with a, another colleague of ours, Dr. Vicki Tiaze, in um, episode, I think, 107. Um, but what happened in this report was what came forth is, of course, the significance of burnout and the incredible impact it's having in healthcare and in nurses and other healthcare providers. And so the result of that really was this, um, this wellness being added as a recommended standard in the report. So we just wanted to check in with you. What are your thoughts about that? What's your perspective of, of wellness being added as a new recommended standard for the 2020-2030 future nursing report? Well, you know, I've been around the block, as we said at the very beginning, a few, a few decades now. <laughs> um, I don't know why we've never paid more attention to it to begin with. It took a pandemic for us to realize that anyone, anyone in any of the caring disciplines has a history of, of needing self-care. Um, mm -hmm. We look at some of the issues in chaplaincy. We, and, uh, we look at um, other disciplines where there is um, high expectations um, that are linked to life and death. Um, certainly, you know, when you think about policing and we look at, at, at fire um, fighters, um, people that are in these categories, somehow we've made ourselves immune, like that's not us. And it totally is us. We have been exposed to some of the most dangerous chemicals on the planet. We've been exposed to death and dying. We have been mm -hmm. exposed to trauma for years. So when I, the, you know, Institute for Healthcare Improvement kind of added that fourth domain of, I, I, I'm never fond of the term burnout because I don't think it means anything anymore. Um, I, I, it's so past burnout. 
you know, burnout is mostly tied to a day or an event. Um, I feel burned out today. We just throw the word around and it doesn't capture the cumulative impact that mm-hmm. has become so evident now with almost two years with the pandemic. So yeah. I'm I'm really relieved almost that it's been acknowledged. Um, I'm almost relieved that nurses are now speaking up to how they've put their lives at risk. And they're burned out and frustrated that people that they're caring for refuse vaccinations, for example, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and, and refuse to do the things that would be, um, that would mitigate the extent of therapy and treatment that, and healing that nurses are going to bring to the table. So I'm relieved that it's in the report. I'm relieved we're talking about it. I'm not sure that we really have the interventions yet. Um, I think we're doing a lot of mindfulness and a lot of like, you know, take a drink after work or do something to chill out, take a walk. Those are all legitimate strategies on a day-to-day coping basis, but they're really not the kinds of heavy therapies that, that nurses really need. And we see this with older nurses who become embittered um, and indifferent. They're not less caring. They have cared so much that there's nothing left in them to give. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I, I can tell you that young nurses come with this energy of, of wanting to make a difference in the world. They just want to do it differently than we do. They, do, they don't want to necessarily do it, you know, 26, you know, 22 hours out of the day, go home for four hours and come back. They have a different <laughs> expectation. But, when I, but so in saying that, I think they're wiser already than we might be. And that we are in a position where we need to acknowledge that some of the way we approach, the way we give and practice um, has been deeply influenced by, by the, the chronic exposure to the toxic and challenging um, and sometimes poorly hierarchical dynamics of what takes place and power differentials within a lot of the healthcare environments where, where we are engaged. Yeah. It's an incredible time, isn't it? It is an incredible time. And our, we've had the awakening and we've had the challenge Mm -hmm. in this new report. And so shame on us if we don't um, address it. And I know of some nursing schools that are, I recently read, you know, the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, um, you know, Dean Vicki Niederhauser there um, has now kind of built that into their curriculum. They've, they've taken leadership to do that. I think other schools are doing that as well. And, and so right. it's, um, I'm encouraged that that's become part of the dynamic. I just hope it's deep enough. You know, if this is just superficial and just talking about it, that's not kind of where it has to go. Um, exactly. So it's kind of a catch term. So let's let's make it real, you know, and, yeah. and this podcast maybe will help challenge that issue. <laughs> let's make this real and not just, you know, yeah. nursey talk. Yeah. Well, to your point, you know, it's more than, you know, meditating. It's more than, I mean, there's some there's some fundamental shifts we have to do individually and organizationally to make this change happen. So to your point, it's not just a surface fix. There's no silver bullet to this. And there's an individual responsibility as well as a system responsibility, mm-hmm. right? The both, both, it's that both and, right? And they both, both have and, to. Both yeah. and. You get <clears throat> yeah. rid of that either or thing. That's um, right. And don't put yeah. the burden on the nurse. The nurse yeah. is the one suffering. So why would we put more burden on the nurse? I think yeah. this report, this, this, report for many people, the, the, the latest future of nursing part two report. I think there is a feeling that a lot of the burden of this report goes onto the nurse mm-hmm. to expand competencies and to re-prepare and to do. And again, it's a very sensitive time because of everything else environmentally. So we've got to handle this with a level of maturity and sensitivity and genuine caring. Um, and so that it's just not one more thing um, that you're, right. you've got to figure out on your own. 
Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we've been learning um, that it's walking the journey with them and it's helping them see it through a whole new way of how they can balance their own health and well-being and actually, you know, also look at it from an organizational perspective as well. Um, and it's, it's, it's dynamic, to your point. It can't be a simple program or just this one webinar. It, and so we're really focused on walking the journey with them as leaders right now so that the well, leaders can impact. Reasons, that's one of the reasons I value you, Michelle. And, and you've done that throughout your career. And I can see that you're doing that with your, you know, the work that both of you are doing now. It's not just a one time. It, it is part of a process. It, yes. It's part of a discovery and awareness. And it's bringing everyone to the table. And yeah. that's what you, that is your gift. That's your legacy mm -hmm. in so many, mm -hmm. at so many levels. But this is important right now. In particular, this is important right now. Yeah. And, and people, you know, we're still, you know, in the midst of it all, right? And so it's, it's getting people to recognize now is the time. You can't wait for calm seas because there's not going to be calm seas for a long time. You got to dive in and you got to take action and, Otherwise, you know, you're even at greater risk. You can't wait for uh, this to settle down because mm -hmm. it's just going to continue to Well, there are turn. international scholars that are studying climate change and whatever, and they're calling this the era of pandemics, plural. Yep. This is mm -hmm. not the only pandemic. This is not the only environmental challenge that's going to face us. And I think for coping reasons, we've all tried to end this, <laughs> like, three generations ago, right? We keep adding versions of this, but this is not going to be the only thing. And so if we don't address it more holistically and don't mm -hmm. understand that this is an era, this is yeah. a new era of life and living. And mm -hmm. um, healthcare is always at the brunt of that, right? We're always at the intersection of what is the social reality um, whether it's trauma care for gunshot wounds or whether it's you name it, we are always at the cusp. When it was the AIDS epidemic, we were there. Um, so we are always at the cusp of social reforms and or social tragedies. So mm -hmm. this is no different than that. So that's why your work is so important. And that's why having this discussion to not mm -hmm. make it superficial, but to go, let's, we've got to go deep on this and we've got to go fast. We don't have yep. time to waste. We don't have time. Exactly. No. And I, and I really believe if there's any, you know, there's a lot of good coming out of the pandemic. There's oh. a lot of innovation mm -hmm. and change. And I think, you know, it's the thing, like you said earlier, like, why didn't we do this before? Well, because there was no impetus to change. There was no force, right, pushing us to change. And sometimes that's what you have to have. And I really feel yeah. like the pandemic is that force. And, you know, to your point, let's let's make good of it, right? Let's not just let this be for not. Let's really take advantage of this opportunity and go for it. Ah. <sighs> Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Do it. All right, team. Uh, okay, Michael. So we've already talked about you know your leadership. You know with the re amazing reports, other bodies of work. I mean, there's a whole list, right? And now you're leading an innovation center in quality and safety, and you just seem to adapt leadership to the times. And I think you're very astute to what's happening around you. And a recent conversation you and I had, you shared with me how you teach polarities in your programs. And uh, so we thought, let's just start there with where did you learn about polarities? And um, tell us a little bit about how you teach about them in your courses. Okay, I'd be I'd be glad to. And the course is just ending, so I, I'm right now. I I'm at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, I used to go before the COVID. I visit in, on campus once a month for like ten days. I do an intensive, and then I would work online. Of course, that has changed. Um, and I teach in the um, nursing leadership and organizational science um, track, and I teach a course in holistic leadership. Um, and so it's part of the course um, that we look at decision making and problem solving. So, um, that, so in one unit in particular, we look at traditional ways of linear problem solving, which nursing process, you know, yeah, there's feedback loops in it, but essentially when you have a problem that's easy to identify, 
and you have a solution and outcome that, and you've got, we're very algorithmically trained as nurses in terms of following the protocol. That's, that's the linear part of it. Um, I'm a fan of complexity science dynamics because most of the world today, including the pandemic that we were just talking about, is not linear. We had no script. One of the hallmarks of leadership, when I was a doctoral student, I had a professor, when I asked, I said, why do they talk about management when they're defining leadership? And why do they talk about leadership when they're defining management? Why do we have both words if they're each just describing each other? And he said, you go figure that out. And so I did. And management really is where we have protocols developed through science, through knowledge, through experience. But the one thing that stood out in leadership is that there is no script. So when the pandemic hit, there was no script to follow. Um, our disaster plans when Katrina hit, they were lovely, yeah. nice plans, but Katrina was of a magnitude that was so beyond what could ever be described in a book. So leaders come in and they work on principles and they work in, in that way. So I, I'm a fan of the complexity dynamics of jumping in and looking at the dynamics of that. And then I started reading about polarity and a friend of mine who was in the Robert Wood Johnson Executive Fellows Program, and then to be really honest with you, you two um, started <laughs> talking a lot more about polarity. And I just realized that this was a dimension yeah. of, of thinking that needed to be explored because no one wants to talk about the fact that there are intractable and unsolvable problems with so many dimensions to them that you will never solve the problem. But it doesn't mean that doing nothing is an alternative. My <laughs> thinking around polarity is that if we can improve the communication dynamics, if we can improve the ability to tolerate differences, if we can open our thinking up that there are certain kinds of issues that benefit from polarity. And so when I teach it, um, I teach a unit so they get exposed to linear problem solving, nonlinear problem solving, and now they get exposed to polarity dynamics. And I have to tell you, students love it because they realize we live in a very polar world. We're not going to solve probably ever certain kinds of social issues immigration in our country, there's no perfect solution that would unify everyone. But it doesn't mean we can't understand each other. It doesn't mean that we can't improve certain aspects, that we can't make it more humane, that we can't make it more balanced. And this is where polarity thinking and the tool set that comes with it improves the dialogue. It improves the sensibility. It improves the capacity of people to want to be together and, and to enjoy the dynamic rather than trying to always solve the problem. And so I like it for that very reason. And, you know, the students' response, most of them are nurse managers at the mid-level. Some of them are not. They are aspiring leaders. They see polarity. The first layer that they see is that, oh, I can use polarity to solve conflict. It's a conflict resolution tool. And I have to point out to them, it's not a resolution tool. It, <laughs> first of all, thank you for thinking in polarities. I always start there because up, up until then, nurses are surprisingly so linear and fearful of getting outside the box that just opening them up to the fact that a lot of things aren't resolved. And we kind of deny that in our practices. So at the second level, then they start to see it, oh, there are some problems that this is a tool set and this is awareness building and it might lead us down some other kinds of paths. So that's the dynamic that goes on with polarity as I try to introduce it as a third tier of decision making. So I like to think that when they finish the course that they are very comfortable with the linear thinking because that's mostly how they've been schooled. I like to think that they... Um, are familiar with nonlinear dynamics because that's the majority of the world. And I like to think that they are comfortable with polarity because we have to accept that some things 
are just that difficult. And yeah. <clears throat> that's what makes life interesting, but we've never had a name for it. We've never had tools associated with it. And we've avoided it for some odd reason, and it's coming to light. And I love the work you're doing. So you two have inspired me to get more involved <laughs> in it and to pay more attention to it. So I'll oh, cool. appreciate feedback offline about whether I'm on the right track or not. But that's how I've made sense out of it. Uh, oh, that's well, great. thank you, Michael. And you know, kudos to you, because it's a hard message to bring sometime, because problem solving has been just the way we look at the world. Um, and we've been bringing that message. If we don't change how we look at problems and recognize many of the issues we deal with our polarities, we're going to be having the same conversation 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And uh, we're super excited to bring polarity intelligence to healthcare. So we've evolved yes. it through our work to really bring the dialogue and the healthy relationship into the whole uh, competency that is being required of leaders right now. And um, and so we know it'll make a huge difference. It'll change healthcare. Well, the Langston yeah. well, Center for Innovation and Quality and Safety has been a playground for me in some ways. Mm -hmm. We are the first center that has tried to build quality and safety into innovation. Most people, it's an afterthought. And mm -hmm. so we put a lot of emphasis on the innovative dynamics of, of problem solving. And then you look at quality and safety, and there are certain kinds of issues that are intractable. Patients will always fall. I mean, mm -hmm. we're never going to, there's no, we would love zero events, but so trying to frame how we look at quality and safety beyond just process design um, is too narrow of a way to approach yeah. how we build in a culture of quality and safety with innovation. So again, mm -hmm. I've, I've enjoyed um, the opportunity to do that work um, at VCU. And again, I thank you for helping enlighten my thinking about that and to be working with a group of affiliate scholars and students mm -hmm. and other people in our health systems, plural, um, and introduce them to these ideas, up to and including a yeah. uh, talk we gave in, um, to a group in Brazil um, wow. who is just beginning to get on the quality safety innovation bandwagon. So these are conversations that I'm doing what I can to push those boundaries along. Yeah, yeah well... <clears throat> You know, a part of innovation is thinking differently, right? And seeing things differently. And so it's just such a great fit, you know, to have polarity be a part of that because it's not just, the, it's not the way we've always seen it. In order to be innovative, you have to see it differently. And that's the lens that we're trying to bring and that you're trying to bring. And um, we know throughout the pandemic and well, throughout the history of healthcare, <laughs> let's just face it, right? <laughs> One of the polarities that's needed to be managed is this tradition and innovation, and um, and so we just kind of were curious, based on your experience and your observations, how well do you think leaders are managing this particular polarity of tradition and innovation? You know, I think we're so steeped in tradition and algorithmic thinking, right? Everything is evidence-based practice, everything. Mm -hmm. Now, the truth is evidence-based practice is critical, it is our science, but our science is still young. And I've heard people say that still 80% of what we do is not based on science. So if we only focus on evidence-based practice, then what do we do? I mean, I was still giving back rubs and now I know I'm shearing skin off. And so I, I have to go back and resolve that guilt um, because we <laughs> gave everybody a back rub two or three times a day. And, so our science has shifted and we must use the science we have. Science is a huge tool and it is critical, but our science is incomplete and it's not yet mature enough. It's not funded enough to be mature enough. We need, need more scientists. So you set that aside. We have so indoctrinated ritual with science that we have really, and I think we live in a risk management world. Risk managers mm -hmm. have scared the bejeebers out of most nurses. And so we, we get to this state of, it's a sad state to be in, but it destroys our creativity. 
So I always think you come into nursing school excited to do certain things and certain tasks and what you think you're going to do. And then by the time, you know, we kind of narrow that down and sometimes even at the doctoral level, you're not, you're rewarded. Our reward systems do not reward innovation. They reward a narrow focus that you spend a lifetime studying and, and analyzing. So I guess where I'm at with, with thinking about creativity and innovation. Um, my, my last assignment in the course I'm teaching, I have, um, I encourage, I push this a lot throughout the course. Be creative. How would you solve this? How would you, and I give them unknown scenarios where it pushes them out of the, the boxes that they're prescribed in because of the roles, the way we've designed our work is so narrow. So here's, here's, I have a student who last, I listened to her assignment last night. She sang her final assignment. She's a beautiful musician and she was integrating the flow of the course and she did it through music. I had another one who did a, a YouTube with her dog to show me how dogs lead, manage and follow. And then she went on and <laughs> talked about, so I, I, I push that creativity. I push the liberal arts because our curriculums are so jammed with learning the things that we forget how to be, we forget how to create. And, and I would say most people graduate with a narrower capacity to be creative and innovation, not a wider one. And so I'm, I'm kind of nervous about nursing education. And, you know, I don't see even in the new essentials enough with the design and innovation. I mean, the words are there, but do we have the maturity in our faculty? Do we have the maturity to break through um, and bring in people that would unleash that creativity other than through crisis? Now, you mentioned earlier, crisis has been a great stimulus for the pandemic has generated innovation. But the innovation, the number one thing is going back to team nursing which is ironic, but in the studying that I've been doing to see what has been innovative, team nursing was developed in the 60s out of New York. And, and we're, there's lots of things. We reinvent a lot, but we don't move it forward. And most people don't even remember where it started from to begin with. So it, we're, not, we're not channeling energy in, in an, a forward-moving way. So I, I do believe there is a huge need for people to be innovative, <clears throat> not only in terms of therapeutics, but in terms of job roles. Um, in my PhD work, I studied extensively how to design work. And I can tell you, our work is designed very poorly. Um, we do not optimize um, our scope of practice. We do not, and a lot, again, it comes out of the fear of, of the repercussions of the system, job roles that we're fighting over rather than why are we fighting over? And then risk management has a scared. How many times have you heard a nurse say, I don't want to lose my license? And I always say to people when I was a CNO, who do you know that's ever lost a license? And I have never had anyone answer that. <laughs> so I'm assuming that we've created a mental model yeah. that we just can't yeah. break through. I don't know what I don't know what you think about all that, but I, that's where I just think we've got a ways to go. Let's just leave it at that. Yep. So we're kind of leaning to the tradition. Yes, <laughs> leaning uh, towards even the tradition. though we need the innovation. Well, and we want uh, something different. That's the ironic part yeah, of this. Yeah, isn't it we paradoxical? Do. We yearn for it. Exactly. Um, and I hear nurses all the time. Oh, I want to give up charting. I want to give up. And I've actually worked in my career <coughs> to reduce charting by thirty percent, but there was not a commensurate return to the patient. There wasn't, you know, we don't know what to do when we take stuff away. It's not like we, we go into the, that environment. Patients and families are hard work. They're messy. They're complicated. And God knows even more so today. So we've got to redesign this and rethink it and find this goes back to the balance. And by the way, I am going to be on a soapbox a little bit more than I am. I, I loathe the word work-life balance. I hate that term. There is no such thing. It is a myth. 
I talk with my students about, and I talk to nurses, not just students, my students that I work with are nurses. And I, when I do, I talk about harmonizing <clears throat> our life, work-life harm, harmonization. The notion that we can balance any part of us is a myth. And so we want it, but we can never get it. There's something always in the way, some tension, right? That's the polarity piece. So why are we talking about balance when there is none? So, but we can harmonize in a way that makes it more holistic and gives us a better chance to find ways to negotiate with ourselves the space where, where we can perform and be creative because therein lies the creativity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we teach people how to, how work-life balance is not 50-50. It's dynamic balance. So it's, it's a very different way to look at it. Um, And that's been the challenge is people don't know how to dynamically balance their, the work-life balance. Um, And so we find that that's, and, and they don't really have a way, they don't really have a proven strategy to help them do it. Well, maybe I can, lasso you, the two of you and we'll start harmonizing more and we'll, yes. we'll, see, we'll, well we, I think we need to talk about it. I'd love to have more conversation. Let's, yeah, let's <laughs> negotiate that and see how we can break through on, on that on that item. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Um, well, we have one more question for you, and unfortunately, we're running a little long on time. But so, I but I do want to share the article that you wrote, and then um, it might even be worthy of a future conversation with us because we see a lot of different polarities in this article as well, Michael, that you wrote. But you re- recently, just October twenty twenty one, wrote an article on Nurse Leader called a, ho- a model of holistic leadership yeah. in post pandemic, which you know again it's that holistic thinking which we know polarity. Uh, intelligence really helps with that type of thinking as well. But we were really struck how you brought that out in this article. And um, you tied it, too, with uh, leadership competencies and different styles of leadership. And um, just share with our uh, listeners why you think this is important to advance right now at this time. Um, I'll be glad to, and I'll be very brief about it, because we've talked a little bit about it along the way here. But Mm -hmm. I always start out with self. And I think a lot of leadership development programs do. If you don't know yourself, if you don't know what your values are, if you really are fuzzy about all that, um, you really are not going to have a very solid foundation to build upon because leadership will only put stress on that. Um, You don't, you know, the foundation of your house maybe cannot accommodate four more stories of, of layers being put on it. So you have to start with that. The second thing is um, to be effective as a leader to break this down, you have to be relational. If you don't have relate, and that doesn't mean extroverted or introverted, forget all that language and stuff. It's, are you relational? Um, are you able to bring people in and out of your lives in a way that is nuanced sometimes or is intentional at other times? Um, and then I think the core of the article is really at the end of the day, How many times have you heard nurses talk about critical thinking? Do you want to tell me? Because if you could tabulate that, it would be better than McDonald's and selling (laughs) 7 billion hamburgers. We, you know, the numbers keep changing. We talk about critical thinking, but we don't link it to critical action. It isn't just about thinking. Nursing is about acting on, on how we think. So the third part to me is always about decision making, which links to action. And so to build on the competencies of decision-making. And that's where, again, I've already shared with you, linear, Mm nonlinear, polarity. That whole big piece is like the core of leadership. But then there is yet another dimension that has taken me a long time to figure out. And for me personally, I call it other thinking. How, How do we look through the eyes of others? And so I have, I have graduate students do an exercise where they have to be on the board of directors and they have to go through a simulation where they function as mostly because they nurses don't think about themselves in those roles and we want nurses to be on boards, but if you don't think you're there, so we've got to build into our thinking about that. But other thinking is simply, it's what Donna Shalala um, really modeled. Other thinking was sitting around that table and listening to other viewpoints 
And to know that you can acquire some of those abilities to look through the lenses of leadership, because that's when you're going to empower, I empower, that's another dynamic word that what does it really mean sometimes? But when you understand power dynamics and you understand how to relate going down to that relational piece again, it's, it's at that bigger level that you can have imp, impact and influence. And so this model is, and that's why I think this is the time. CNOs mm -hmm. were all of a sudden, they were functioning as CEOs um, and no one was questioning them. Physicians were more than happy to, because nurses understood the whole dynamic of what made the systems work in the pandemic. So I think that's why this is the time for holistic leadership. And I think certain models, transformational leadership, you know, for me, I like the notion of transformation. I interviewed four people back to back one day and they all told me they were transformational leaders. So I knew that that was the buzzword. And then I asked them what they transformed and not one person could name one thing that had been, they transformed. And I said, well, how do you justify what is, so then I realized it has no meaning and servant leadership. I like the idea of, of being relational, but to think of this, sometimes it's just like a one-way dynamic. And I'm sorry, but yeah. servant leadership is a recipe for burnout <clears throat> if, mm -hmm. if it's not balanced with harmonization again. So yeah. I finally just kind of said, these theories ha have value and there are elements. But to me, when I think about nursing, we're biopsychosocial, cultural, spiritual beings, right? We we say as a discipline, we are the holistic practitioners. That's what we say. We learn to look through that lens, which is different than how a physical therapist or an occupational therapist or a chaplain, they have more slices that they focus on. But nursing says we're, we say we're holistic. And I thought, well, why not make holistic leadership where you can see the upstream and the downstream and you can take why don't we take that knowledge base that we've been schooled in and apply it to leadership and where we can write the script and we can adhere to the script when it comes to managing and where we can model healthy followership, where we acquiesce and relate and inner to me, that is where the dance happens. You know, it's kind of like watching the last episode of Dancing with the Stars. You have a call, <laughs> you have someone that's got some disability, and through it all, you learn how to create, innovate, modify, mm -hmm. and yet you're following a rhythm of a very prescriptive, whatever the dance is. If it's a tango, if it's a whatever, you're following that script, but creating, and at the end, you don't really know who the pro is and who the amateur is. So it's that dynamic that I, that allows me to enjoy the thought of being a holistic leader. And I think we need more people like that in our discipline and to recreate and transform an actual <laughs> healthcare delivery system and not just all the pieces. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, we can relate in yeah. so many different <laughs> levels. And what you bring up is just that so many of those things are accurate, like servant leadership, but it's not complete as an as just one example that you mentioned in, in that. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, what I really appreciated, and we'll have to have you back on, and we'll go in yes. detail on this. But I think what I appreciated is everything we've been calling for new norms and leadership. And I think this aligns so much with the work that we're doing from a polarity intelligence perspective. And there's so many of the things that, that you have in that model that really um, spoke to us and relate to the work that we've been doing. So we're going to, we're going to have this, continue this conversation. Okay. Yes. Okay. Definitely. But we're yeah. at the end of our time. Yes. <laughs> so now we got to get to the missing logic questions. Are you ready? <laughs> These are the missing questions in the interview. This is where we get to know you a little bit more on a personal side. We know a lot about your thoughts and your, you know, your uh, professional side of your life. But we're going to ask just a couple of questions. Nothing you can't handle. Are you ready? I think I'm ready. <laughs> ah, you're ready. You're ready. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so the first one is, what is your favorite kind of music? 
Oh, well, you know, I said it earlier, I was a music major. And so I would, I would, I would lean more toward cla- Broadway classics. Okay. Mm, awesome. I love, love Broadway it. and I love classical music. And sometimes those two really do come together pretty much. Yeah. So mm-hmm. no, that would be my absolute favorite. Oh, that's great. Okay. Now. Think about this for just don't overthink Wicked is it, my just... favorite musical. I'll throw that in. I love Wicked <laughs> oh, oh. And, 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 and I love Les Mis. So those are my two major, major musicals that I, I All right. Deep two effect. awesome ones. Okay. Oh. Question number two is. Okay. <laughs> you have been gifted a private chef to prepare a dinner for you and your closest friends and family. What's on the menu? I would go back to Italy and I would go Italian, the best Italian food. And, you know, St. Louis is known for the hill and it's Italian food, but it's, it's pretty heavily sauced. Um, And so I would go back to Italy where the flavors are blended and every flavor has kind of a whole new meaning. So it would definitely be Italian and it would be done (laughs) in the style of actual um, couple of different parts of Italy. That would be, oh my gosh, let it oh, happen. Could, let, let it, it happen. happen. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see Stanley Tucci's special on that? On I, 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 I'm afraid to tell you, I drooled through the entire thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I I it's got a book I, out too, you know. <laughs> I had a napkin um, on each side because it, it created that kind of a, a, of a, physiologic response. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> that was fabulous. Yeah. Oh, that is so great. That's so great. So now it's time for the wrap up question, Michael. And uh, we always like to bring polarity intelligence in, in the end. And as you know, we're helping people with that and both thinking. And one of the things polarities teach us is that we have a preference poll. Um, we can appreciate both, but we do have a preference poll. So I'm going to throw out a polarity and I want you to tell us what your preference poll is. And the polarity is being or doing? Being. And, and my sense of being is that it gives us meaning to what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, it gives us a purpose. And it grounds us in our values. If we do things, we can do things for the sake of doing them. And, and not link our values and our passions and our whatever to them. So if you want yeah. to sustain yourself, the, in my mind, being um, being becomes very important, especially in the long term. Yeah. Uh, well, you definitely need both, but I, need, I can oh, see just, I, just talking to you, I, it's, it's not surprising that you lean towards being. <laughs> yeah, I, and you, you're right. And, and you heard me talk about critical thinking and critical action. Yeah. I totally value the doing. I totally, yes. yeah. I'm a, you know, my uh, Myers-Briggs moniker is an ENTJ. We like getting things done. And and I do. I like seeing things. But but I over life, over my life, I've learned that the being part really um, can drive the doing at, in a much different way. So yeah, thanks yeah. for that. What a profound um question you guys are amazing at what you do <laughs> well, well, who is the person in new york that used to interview the movies all these different movie stars and whatever he was a very from nyc i think um, oh yeah inter- yeah you you kind of remind me didn't he always ask a question about heaven or hell or something at the end? <laughs> or who's yeah. waiting for you in heaven i don't know what it was but <laughs> yeah, you yeah, are yeah. taking me a flashback to that tv show <laughs> and and you're putting your own spin on it, which I again is what you're gifted at doing. So yeah, oh, um, thank you. I'll oh, be thanks, thinking Michael. about that for the rest of the day. So at, at two in the morning, when I can't remember, I'll think, oh, maybe it should have been. <laughs> so was um, it Lipton? Was it Lipton? Was his name? Oh, Lipton. Yes, Lipton. Lipton. What? What was his first name? Um, Oh, I'm blanking on it right now. Robert, um, we got to call Tracy's husband. <laughs> I used to watch it all the time. My favorite one was when he interviewed Robert Robin Williams. Oh. Was my favorite, absolute uh, favorite yes, one. I'm with you on that. Yeah, Lipton. 
Well, we'll oh my gosh, we'll what a fantastic interview, Michael. Oh, you know, we got to get back together. That's that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for sharing your just your expertise and leadership and your experiences. And um, I just think that your journey is so insightful for all of us to learn from. And we really do look forward to future conversations with you. Yeah, I'm so well, inspired. Oh. Well, I, you and both of you inspire me. So it's very much mutual. And I thank you for the work that you're out doing because it's an it's an area that is far too um, limited and undiscovered. So um, yeah. anything that I can do to be helpful on your journeys, um, know that I'll always try to be the wind in your sails. So thank you um, for this opportunity. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And for our listeners, that's yeah. a wrap on another episode of Healthcare's Missing Logic podcast. And we look forward to connecting with you all again in next week, right? Yeah, next all week. All right. Take care. Stay safe, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Healthcare's Missing Logic podcast, now a top-rated podcast for healthcare leaders. Please share this podcast with other healthcare leaders and anyone else you think would benefit. We are certain that if you found value in it, they will too. If you haven't already done so, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any episodes. And also, it would mean the world to us if you took a quick moment to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast player. It helps to get the word out about our podcast and incredible guests. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to watch our podcasts. You can also follow us on our Missing Logic social media channels, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Until next time.